You are listening to Law and Gospel on this Wednesday, May the 8th, in the year of our Lord, 2024. I'm Pastor Tom Baker, and on this Wednesday, we're going to take a look at another reading for this coming Sunday, the seventh Sunday of Easter. We're going to be taking a look at 1 John chapter 5, but we're also going to be using a different translation than the ESV. We're using what's called the Holy Bible, an American translation, translated by William F. Beck. Now, William F. Beck was Lutheran. Uh, He's died, but there's no doubt he's got a very interesting translation. He tries to put it in the words of the people of the day. He was long devoted to the cause of simplifying the English Bible for people of all ages. He had one driving purpose, to help others understand the Bible. The Lutheran Church Missouri Synod's Concordia Publishing House published an American translation in 1963. Dr. Beck wrote in the preface in his translation of the New Testament, the preservation of our New Testament is a marvel of God's wisdom. It came through fire and sword. So we're going to be taking a look at 1 John chapter 5, which is a reading for the seventh Sunday of Easter. It begins, Everyone who believes Jesus is the Christ is God's child. Wow. Stop and think about that. That ought to be put on a poster hanging in the church because it shows the huge difference between the church and the world. The world would say, everyone who obeys Jesus is God's child. In other words, they want their good works to be the reason for their salvation. That's how the world thinks. But we as Christians know that we are always going to be sinful this side of heaven because we have an old Adam and it's always fighting against the new Adam that the Holy Spirit gave us in the words of baptism. And in that wonderful sacrament, we received the gift of the Holy Spirit and we received faith. What does faith mean? It means we believe that Jesus is God's child. Beck goes on, and everyone who loves the father loves the father's child. Yeah, that makes sense. If you know of someone and you really appreciate their father, many times you will also love the child of that father. And that's true when it comes to God. We know we love God's children when we love God and do what he orders us to do. Now notice, it doesn't say that we become God's children by loving God and doing what he orders us to do. Rather, when we love God, God, and do what he orders us to do. That shows us we are his child. And that occurs 
in what's called the life of sanctification. Until a person is justified by grace through faith, it is impossible to truly love God. I mean, we hear hear these days in this country the word love used in many ways. Two people who are not married are living together and they give the excuse that they love one another. No, that is not love. And therefore, they will not be blessed in that particular relationship. They will instead be cursed by God. And that is why there is so much division between such relationships in the world today. Loving God means we keep his commandments, but we keep them because we love God. We don't keep them in order to get to heaven because we are already on our way to heaven when we are saved by grace, through faith, on account of Jesus Christ. And then it says, what he orders us is no burden. It's no burden to obey his commandments because in our new relationship with God, we love to obey the Father because we love God. And we love him in a way, not in order to get to heaven, but because we are on the way to heaven. Verse 6. I'm sorry. Verse 4 continues. Every child of God conquers the world. Our faith is the victory over the world. Now, what's that talking about? The world is filled with the devil and our flesh. How do we conquer it? We conquer it by our faith. Our faith believes the promises of Jesus Christ. And therefore, When we are in Jesus, we are enabled to overcome the temptations of the world and obey the will of God. And we do so because of our love for Jesus Christ, because of what he did for us by dying on the cross and taking our place in pain for our sins. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He paid for our sins. And when he paid for our sins, guess what? We are saved. Verse 5. Who conquers the world but he who believes Jesus is God's son? That's a question. That is the person who conquers the world, the one who believes that Jesus is God's son. As verse one says, everyone who believes Jesus is the Christ, is God's child. So you become a member of the family through faith it results in then an obedience with a perfect motivation, namely love for Jesus Christ. Verse 6, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. That's talking about the fact 
that when he died on the cross, when the spear was put into him, out gushed water and blood. It was no longer a proper mixture, but showed a true death of God himself. Going on in verse 6, and the Spirit is telling the truth because the Spirit is the truth. So when you read the Bible, which is inspired by the Holy Spirit, you can be sure that what it is saying is truth because the Holy Spirit is regarded as truth. Just as Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so also the Father, when he speaks, speaks the truth. So there's a lot in the Bible that just seems confusing and even at times contradictory. The, the whole message of Christianity that God forgives sinners, not because they've stopped from sinning, but because they are repentant of their sin and following John the baptizer has that repentance, which is sorrow over sin, asking for forgiveness. And God provides that forgiveness. The Spirit is indeed truth. Verse 7, there are three who bring us the truth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three have one purpose, and that is to save you who believe that Jesus is the Christ. By faith, you are saved, resulting in obedience. It's kind of like, and we mentioned this many a time, a child. A child doesn't become a child of the parents because they are obedient. No, they become a child because they are either begotten or adopted. In Christianity, there is only one begotten, and that's Jesus the Christ. But all the members of the family are adopted. That's mentioned in Galatians and other places in the Bible. So, verse 9, if we accept the testimony of men, God's testimony is greater because God's testimony is the truth. He told about his son. And if you believe in God's son, verse 10 says, you have in you the testimony of the truth. Now, anyone who will not believe God has made him a liar because he hasn't believed the truth God told about his son. So, Holy Scripture is not just the words of the Holy Spirit, who is truth. Holy Scripture includes the words of God the Father. And anything he says is also truth, especially as he speaks about his son. And he spoke about his son throughout the Old Testament, giving promise after promise 
that he would come into the world to redeem the world. He would be incarnate in order to be crucified, resurrected, and exalted to the right hand of God. So, verse 11, he, referring to Jesus Christ, told us this truth, that God has given us everlasting life, and this life is in his Son. Your everlasting life does not begin when you are born. It begins when you come to faith. And that's why it's so important that we baptize infants, for they come to faith and are therefore receiving everlasting life at their baptism. Even when they die on earth, their spirit will immediately go to heaven, awaiting the day of judgment. Therefore, verse 12, if you have the Son, you have life. So, am I asked, were you to die tonight, would you go to heaven? My answer is, yes, I would but not because I've done any good works to earn heaven, but because I believe that Jesus is God's child and that by his death on the cross, my sins were forgiven. Verse 14. We have confidence in God that if we ask for anything according to his will, he listens to us. Now, notice it doesn't say if we ask for anything, he will give it to us. No, he will give it to us if we ask for anything according to his will. Now, when I was younger, I wanted to buy a motorcycle. But God's representatives, namely my mother and father, said no. I was too young. And so that was God not giving me what I wanted because this was not his will. But when I read the Bible and I ask for increased faith, God gives it to me because what I'm asking is according to his will. And therefore, when it says he listens to us, that means that he gives to us what we request according to his will. Verse 15, and if we know that he listens to us, whatever we ask, we know that we will get what we ask him for. It's kind of like my parents. If I wanted to go to a movie, but I didn't have the money, I would ask mom or dad, and they would not only drive me to the movie, but give me the money to get in. That was according to their will. But if they felt it wasn't the right movie to see, or I was too young to be by myself, they would say no. In other words, every time God answers our prayer. He does it because it is always for our good. Verse 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning, 
but the sin isn't deadly, he should pray and God will give him life for those who sin if the sin isn't deadly. There is a sin that's deadly. I don't tell you to pray for it. Every kind of wrong is sin, but there is a sin that isn't deadly. What's the difference between a deadly sin and a non-deadly sin? It's the difference between repentance or no repentance. So if a person is sinning and they are not repentant of that sin, we don't pray for them that their sin be forgiven because they're not requesting from God for that sin. That's a deadly sin. When, for example, a husband may say he stops loving the wife and gets a mistress, that's a deadly sin where there is no repentance and a desire to stay married as he had promised at the marriage ceremony. So every kind of wrong is sin, but there is a sin that isn't deadly. And that is the whole idea of repentance. Verse 18, we know that no child of God goes on sinning but God's son protects him and the evil one doesn't touch him. How does that occur? That's explained in verse 19. We know that we are God's children and that the whole world is in the power of the evil one. But Jesus has defeated the evil one on the cross. As Genesis 3.15 says, the evil one will injure Jesus. He will wound him. That's the cross. But in that wounding, Jesus will crush the head of the serpent the devil. That means he will put him to death. And though he has a lot of power in the world, the Christian will be protected from that, from that power. Verse 20, we know that God's son came and gave us the understanding to know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and everlasting life. Children, keep away from idols. That's just a summary of the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me means we should fear, love, and trust in the true God. And we have eternal life, protection from the devil, and freedom from eternal death. That is a wonderful good news. And that's why it's called the gospel. The gospel is totally different than the law. The law says, do this and you will live. But it's impossible 
for anyone to do the law of their own will, and they fall short of the glory of God. But the gospel says, believe this and you will live. And that faith to believe the promises of Jesus Christ are given to us by the Holy Spirit, who is truth. Therefore, knowing Jesus Christ, which we receive as a gift from the Holy Spirit, means we have everlasting life. We need to get that message across to people in the world because many of them are worried knowing what sinners they are. They can't imagine that heaven will be their home. But heaven will be their home because they believe that Jesus Christ is God's child, and therefore, they are saved. Join us tomorrow for more information on the distinctions between law and gospel. I'm Tom Baker. You've been listening to Law and Gospel. God bless you. Listen to Law & Gospel each weekday morning at 9.30 on KFUO. For a tax-deductible gift to Law & Gospel, please make your check out to Law & Gospel and mail to Law & Gospel P.O. Box 28910, St. Louis, Missouri, 63132, or call toll-free 1-877-267-1962. Views and opinions expressed on Worldwide KFUO may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you'd like to comment on programs or topics heard on Worldwide KFUO, write us at KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. You can also leave a question or comment on our comment line at 314-996-1542. We are the messenger of good news, Worldwide KFUO.